Hello and welcome to Physionic, where we learn the body from the macro to the micro. If that's something you think you'd be interested in, then consider subscribing. This exam and content today will be dissecting this particular paper uh, known for long-term effects of marijuana, the devil's lettuce, weed, on the brain. So if that's what you're here to find out about, then I will have this paper linked down in the description box for you. And with that said, let's jump into this exam in peace. So let's jump into exactly how they went about this study, the methods section. A little bit on that, and then we can get into the ever exciting results. So for the methods, they did look at human participants. They did have males and females, and they had them split between controls as well as uh, marijuana users. So the controls were individuals that had never smoked or had smoked a long, long time ago and were now clear of any sort of marijuana. And they did a urinalysis to make sure that that was the case. Now, on the other hand, the marijuana users had to use marijuana four times or smoke marijuana four times or more per week. So kind of continuous use of the drug. And they'd been smoking marijuana since around the age of 18, some younger, some a little bit later by a few years. And they had to have done so for essentially uh, a number of years. So not just, you know, for a month or anything of that nature, but actually for numbers of years, potentially even a decade. Now, in terms of the actual methods that they used, they used a functional MRI, which allows you to image the brain. And they specifically focused on what's called the orbitofrontal cortex, which is the very front part of our brain. So it's implicated in reward sensation, as well as thinking and sensory units and really just a bunch of different integrations. When it comes down to the brain, you can focus on particular segments that it might focus on, but of course the entire brain is going to be highly integrated with itself. And they looked at uh, brain volume, so the overall size of the brain. They looked at the density of the brain, so how many neurons are kind of within a tightly packed region. And they looked at the connectivity between neurons. So using those three measures, they were able to determine the impact that weed, marijuana, has on the brain after chronic use. So with that said, with that out of the way, let's jump into the ever exciting results. So table one is looking at essentially just kind of the background on all these participants. Are there any significant differences between the participants before the study actually starts? So between chronic marijuana users compared to control subjects, was there a difference? And in almost every single regard, there wasn't a difference, which is usually what you want at the start of a study. However, there was one key difference. So they did an IQ test and they found that control subjects, so non-users, had a higher IQ at the beginning of the study compared to marijuana users. Now, I will touch on that in a little bit more detail later on because I realize that most people probably just jump to the conclusion of, well, marijuana then lowers our IQ. Well, we're gonna touch on that, so hang tight. So for figure one, you're seeing a, a representation of an MRI. And of course, usually when you look at MRI, you might see various areas of the brain actually lit up. But actually, what they're looking at is that orbitofrontal cortex, so right above the eye or right around where the eyes would be. And that is where you see there's an actual difference. And just to, to, to set the record straight, the reason why you're not seeing two different images, one for control and one for the marijuana users is because they're using the control as a baseline. So essentially they just wanna know, is there a difference off of the control, the control being the baseline, is there a difference with the marijuana users? And what they find is that yes, so this is a measure of brain volume, so kind of the size of the brain and they see that there's a statistically significant decrease 
in brain volume with marijuana users. Now, figure two is where they're looking at connectivity. So they're using a similar method, but they're looking at neuron connectivity. So how uh, close or how much are these neurons actually communicating back and forth with one another? And interestingly, what they find is that with marijuana users, you see a greater activity. So you see greater connectivity between neurons. And that's going to be obviously divergent from what we saw with the volume of the brain. The volume of the brain is decreased, but the connectivity of the brain is actually increased with marijuana users. Now we're gonna cover figure four, and there are other figures, there are other tables, although I've covered most of the material in this paper. If you'd like to check out the other tables and the other uh, figures, then certainly you're welcome to the paper's open access so you can read through it yourself. But I did wanna focus on figure four because here you have another example of a change with marijuana use. This is an example of diffusivity. So high diffusivity means that there's high amounts of space or large amounts of space between the neurons. So there's open, empty space between neurons. And if you have low diffusivity, of course, then that means that they are more tightly packed together that there's less space between neurons. Now you can interpret that in whatever means that you want. However, with marijuana use, you see a, an initial decrease in diffusivity where the neurons are coming closer together and that actually pans out really well with some of the other data, the decrease in volume, but also an increase in connectivity so the neurons might be communicating more and might be kind of closing in on one another more with marijuana use, at least initially. And then what they do is they project based off of the data and they think that there's going to be an increase based off of the data that they have, an increase in diffusivity with chronic marijuana use. Now, again, however you interpret that, that's up to you, but we're gonna be covering that or possible reasons and possible situations in the conclusion section. But so far, there's an increase in diffusivity chronically and sort of acutely within you know, a few years of marijuana use, there is a decrease in diffusivity. Now there were two added notes that were in the actual written section and I wanted to quick address those. So uh, one of the first things that I said in this particular piece of content was that uh, you saw a decrease, there was lower IQ points for individuals who were chronic marijuana smokers. So they did address that. And it turns out that there is no correlation between marijuana use and the lowered IQ. And they have some speculations as to why that might be the case uh, that I'll cover in the conclusion section. Now, the other thing that they focused on was the fact that in animal studies, in other studies, they found that uh, animals actually have a toxicity to marijuana. So if that necessarily translates to humans, we don't know, uh, at least based off of this paper. But what we can say is that in animal studies, based on their report, there is a toxicity with the use of marijuana. So let's discuss this a little bit. Let's go into a bit of the conclusions. What can we conclude? Well, based off of this study, we can say that marijuana use does decrease brain volume. So it decreases the kind of the size of the actual brain. Now it does, however, also increase connectivity. So the neurons themselves are uh, communicating more with one another or are uh, getting in patterns that enhance connectivity. They also, in just a few years of marijuana consumption, and I'm saying consumption because, well, it can be in a number of different ways, uh, but with the uh, number of years of marijuana consumption, you see a decrease in diffusivity. However, then over time, you see an increase in diffusivity. Now, they had a few different speculations as to why that might be the case, and this is actually where things get really interesting, and this is where things start getting into more muddled water, where you have to figure out if you believe one or the other. So on the negative, what they thought could be happening is you're eventually getting neuron death. So you're getting cell death in the brain from chronic, continuous uh, use of marijuana. Now again, that's after many years of consumption of marijuana. They also thought maybe the cells are shrinking, most likely not a benefit as well. But on the positive end, they did mention that it's also possible that you're seeing a lowered inflammation 
of the brain. And they, they did cite some studies in which uh, they did show decreases in inflammation, so it's anti-inflammatory. And in that regard, then you're seeing the, the brain volume decrease because the fluid volume is going to be uh, removed as well as, or at least some of the fluid volume will be removed, as well as some of the immune cells that are in that area because anti-inflammatory would mean that you have lower amounts of immune cells. So lower cells, of course, is going to then mean that most likely the brain will shrink. And of course, that diffusivity also plays into that because you're going to see decreases in the amount of space between neurons because they're not being infiltrated by a number of different immune cells. So taking those out or at least reducing the number of them can increase uh, the connectivity uh, between the different neurons. Now, a final point that I wanna touch on is actually something completely independent of marijuana. How can we see all of these results and yet still attribute it to marijuana in this situation? Well, think about it. This is still a retrospective study. They are looking back based off of people's previous behavior. They're not necessarily applying a stimulus and then seeing the outcome of that stimulus. So in this situation, they did mention that there are studies that show that kids 12 years old that had their brain imaged showed lower brain volume previous to marijuana use and then showed a correlation with increased marijuana use later in life. So they weren't using marijuana before and then they, but they had their brain scanned and they had lower volume or at least of gray matter specifically. And then later on, they found that those individuals, those kids, uh, four years later specifically showed increased uh, marijuana use compared to control kids or 12 year olds that did have normal or average size brains. So is it possible that individuals who are more predetermined or more predestined to consume marijuana already have the features of the brain that would indicate those increases in connectivity, those decreases in diffusivity, and those decreases in brain volume. So before they even start marijuana consumption, they could already have all of those brain outcomes. And then we're just measuring it after X amount of time that they've been consuming marijuana. That is a possibility. So can we necessarily rule that out? No, we cannot. But I would venture to say, this is just personal opinion here, that marijuana does have some sort of an impact on the brain. It most likely did present that effect, that difference between the control subjects and the marijuana using subjects. Now, if that's positive or if that's negative, positive being anti-inflammatory and kind of a neuronal restructuring, a neuronal remodeling, or if we're talking about the negative in which we're seeing cell death and the shrinking of the actual neurons themselves over time, that is still to be determined. This paper does not give any evidence of one or the other. Okay, that is that. That is the piece of content I have for you today. Hopefully you found it informative. Hopefully you got something out of it. And I certainly hope that I have the absolute pleasure of speaking with you in the next one. Have a good one, guys. See ya. <laughs>